my life was was on the balance of like, okay, do I want to continue living or should I just end it? Aaron, thanks yes. for coming by. However I meet everybody is through the interwebs. And that's really how our relationship began. And soon thereafter, you started to do something that I've not seen very many people do, which is take very little bits of information that I give and just run. And it almost scared me how fast you were moving. We know lots of people within our peer coaching group that are in different levels of their business, their design practice. But you and a couple others have been able to like take it and just go to the next level really quickly. What do you attribute that to? What are you doing differently that allows you to have that kind of success? I mean, the truth is, is like I just take your information that you give me and I apply it immediately. And if I don't have a situation that I can apply it to immediately, I seek out situations where I can apply what you're teaching me immediately. So, I mean, to me, it's really just action equals outcome. I, I say that a lot. You're in a position of where I would like to see myself in a few years. So when you say jump, I say how high. That's what I look for from a mentor. So when you tell me to do something, I don't question it. Um, I trust the process and I do it. I, I took my first W9 job in a call center. And then I kind of learned these like fundamental principles of entrepreneurship early on because the guy who was running the call center, I'm like, dude, I'm smarter than this guy. I could run a bit. If this guy can do it, like so can I. Is this where you're cold calling people? When you see a call center, it's yeah. not like because you need help with your Macintosh or I something. Was in a call, no, no, it was okay. definitely not you need help with your Macintosh. I was selling the next latest and greatest thing that was. Whatever it was. Or whatever. They're like, hey, here's the sheet. I mean, have you ever seen like Boiler Room or Wolf? Yeah, Wolf? is that really what it okay, was? Okay, so it's like very similar to that. I got this entrepreneurial mindset, but I learned the game. And to me, the game was that success doesn't get handed to you. You fail and you fail and you fail and you fail until something sticks and then you do that some more, there's no guarantee, right, that, that, that anything is going to actually work out. So understanding that part of the game, I knew that I have to collect a, a handful of little failures to find my little success. And just knowing that, I, I expect failure. Um, I expect it. It's, it's, an, it's literally the ante to play the game. You're willing to accept that failure or making mistakes or maybe even, uh, being embarrassed or your ego kind of getting a punch a little bit, um, it, it's okay, you accept that. I know that you know if, if, if I was a quarterback, and I'm not big into sports, but I'm, this is just a good analogy, is like if I'm a quarterback, I, I can almost expect that in some point in the game, I'm going to get sacked and I'm not gonna even see it coming, right? Like they know that that's part of the game. That's why they wear freaking pads. So for me, it's the same type of thing in business. It's like, I know that I'm gonna get sacked. Um, you know, today I'm up, tomorrow I might be down. I was actually a pretty big troublemaker. I've been in I've been in some dark places in my life. So for me, I've hit this low of lows. The activities that I do today will never bring me there, okay? My worst case scenario right now is I would, you know, lose my house, lose my vehicles. Um, you know, we'd have to move in with our parent-in-laws or something, you know, or, or my grandparents. Like that's kind of my worst case scenario. So when you look at that, the worst case scenario really isn't that bad. You know, there are, there are parts of the world where they'd still chop your hands off if you get caught stealing. You know, so what's my worst case scenario? Well, some luxury problems, right? I'm still here. I could always go get a job. Um, so even that's not really that bad. So I don't understand why more people aren't willing to risk more. Maybe their maybe their tolerance and their low is like, oh, I don't want to lose that comfort thing. Um, but I, I don't see well if if that's the if that's what you're not willing to lose, then you're not going, to, like you're not even in my competition. I'm not even looking at you. Is there a way that you can describe that dark place so that we kind of have a little bit of context? I don't know what that yeah. means. Um, yeah, I mean, I was in, I, I've, I've been in jail many times, um, mostly drug related. So I, 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 you know, I battled with a lot of different drug addiction um, and it brought me to a place of suicidal. So we're not even talking about business. We're talking about literally my life was was on the balance of like, okay, do I want to continue living or should I just end it? I don't have those thoughts in business. I mean, I don't have a bad day or lose a, you know, lose a project and think, oh man, I'm going to go home and kill myself. It, you know, so the low that I had was so low that there's really nothing that can happen unless I start using 
drugs again, right? Um, to where I'll ever get to that point. And I think everyone can kind of define their own low. You know, maybe your low is unemployment. Maybe your low is, um, is the loss of a relationship or a family member or something like that. You know, it's not me to judge. I just know what my low was and I don't think that I'll ever go back there. If I do, God forbid, I have a lot bigger problems than losing my business. We've all had some kind of dark spots in our life. I think you sharing that makes you a lot more kind of grounded. I see you're a very self-confident guy, a very well-spoken, gregarious, alpha type. You know, a person who's willing to work in a call center, that's not your typical creative type. Fear of rejection is the last thing that I'm worried about. Yeah. You know, rejection's a joke. Right. Who cares? I get rejected. My wife rejects me every day. You know, like, <laughs> I love her to death, but you know what I'm saying? I get shot down yeah. all the time. So sure. like, to me, um, yeah, a rejection, and that's what you get in business. That's, I think, what most people are, are afraid of when it comes to business and entrepreneurship is fear of like rejection or fear of something that's, that could potentially not even happen but hasn't even happened yet. What else would you attribute to your ability to not pause too long and then go for it? People want to be where I'm at, so right. I've given advice to people, and um, and they'll call me and, and pretty much tell me every single problem and issue that's going on in their life or why they're not in a position like I am to have the results that I am, and it's just a bunch of excuses. You know, I could do that. I could I could call you and say, man, uh, this and this. I don't have awards. I don't have this and that. I don't have all the things that you have lined up, so I can't do what you do. But I don't do that. Like you tell me to do something, and I do it. So I look for the opportunities over, you know, just kind of bringing up all the BS that's going on or all the reasons why I didn't, you know, get that thing I'm trying to get. Instead of looking at the, you know, one way it will succeed, they look at the 99 ways it can fail. And you're the kind of guy who's like, let me focus on the positive results. Humans are more motivated by what they have to lose versus what they have to gain. They, they fear more what they have to lose. But if we just retrain our mind, and this is mostly about a mindset, 100% right? dude, mindset 100%. Because before we talked, I didn't feel confident just having a business that's centered around strategy. And now, like since even since we started working together, like that's all I do now is strategy. And I have 100% confidence just selling my thoughts and my ideas and my ability to facilitate rather than my designs and my websites and, and the actual manifestation of what that looks like. So, um, but that was a mindset shift. And I think it was something that, I don't know if it was something that directly happened because you said something or just because I saw the opportunity and I was like, well, hey, I've started charging for this. This is where I wanna go. This is what I enjoy doing. Why don't I just go all in? And that's what I did, like I've, I've just gone all in. Now I get to go and have an incredible experience with an amazing client in another part of the world and I'm now a global consultant. Like that to me is pretty freaking rad. When you say a global consultant and you're like being paid to think, what is that in real terms? Like, what does that look like? I used to, um, when I owned an agency, we did identity design, print, business cards, a lot of business cards, um, web design. I mean, our average ticket size was about twenty-five dollars to $3,500. And that included everything I just mentioned, probably and a bunch of other shit because I was trying to build value because I didn't understand how to build value. I thought building value was throwing more items on, right. on the contract, right? I used to do that. I think creative people working in the service industry get gratification by doing what they do and hope that by doing more of it and giving better service to their client, providing greater value, that it would be reciprocated. Right. And did you find that to be true or no? No, it was worse. I, I was literally a slave to my computer 80 hours a week. Um, my wife was pregnant at the time and I was like, man, if I continue on this path, like I'm gonna reach a whole new emotional, personal low. It's not about business. I was making money. I was, um, I was empty with the work that I was doing. It was not fulfilling anymore. Why not? Well, first of all, to get to the results that I wanted to get to, I had to have hundreds of clients. Literally, and we had about a little over 400 clients that, on a local level. That we're talking small projects, 500, 2,000. You know, so to meet my financial goals, that we had to do volume. This tonnage. So what that meant was that every day I came into the office and I got on my computer, there's 70 emails. I need you to push this button over here. I need you to change this image over here. Can you, this is spelled wrong. Oh, you know, and it's like, mm. okay, 
this is not that's the, the real grind of work that I want right like, that's the bane of my existence right well you're touching on a lot of different things here so I have to encapsulate for our audience sure. here um, the first part is about you becoming a knowledge worker versus like a laborer okay and so I'm gonna probably get into some trouble here so I have to be a little bit more careful about how I phrase this you were essentially an order taker when you said you have 400 emails or 60 emails and it's like changes do this do this what was happening to you and psychologists have studied this right is that you're being told what to do so you feel like you you've lost control and you, the more you do it the more you feel like you're not making any progress so you're stuck it's like a hamster running on a wheel over and over and over again and so you're stuck just being like you want fries okay hold the ketchup okay and so that you've you're kind of at the bottom of the value pyramid and you've kind of inverted it and now you're at the top. Now the clients do what you want to do with them and so now you're a partner, a collaborator, a consultant. You're focused on the goals and not the tactics as opposed to before you're purely focused on the tactics. You couldn't even, you didn't know what the goals were. So that's pretty awesome. Now some of you guys who are interested in this uh, topic of happiness, uh, Tony Shea talks about in his book, uh, the. Uh, delivering happiness. He talks about the four pillars of happiness. So one of them is perceived control, and you've lost it. Perceived progress, which you're just doing the same thing over and over again, and that's gonna drive most people crazy. Uh, the two other ones, less relevant to our conversation now, is uh, feeling like you belong to a group. So maybe you just felt like grinding away 80 hours disconnected you from human beings and other things that gave you pleasure, spending time with your wife or going out with friends. And the last one is just a belief in a power greater than you. But those first two are very critical, perceived control and perceived progress. We need those as human beings to feel happy. Let's take it back to your whole mindset. Uh, you don't strike me as a guy who's gonna be sitting around waiting for stuff. Like you don't strike me as a very patient person. Is that part of your mindset that helps you to take action? I'm extremely impatient. <laughs> Well, I, I can see that. Impatient. I can see that. You can see like you're like ready to bounce off the walls. Yeah, no, I'm extremely impatient. It's a character defect, but also a character asset. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that I've leveraged. I, I'm very aware of my defects, and I try to manage those with having aligned with other really awesome partners. Like I have two partners that are absolutely incredible. They do things that I am not good at, right? I don't really stop. Like I, I'm very clear. I, I, I've done a lot of internal reflection on myself as far as what do I want out of life. I, I want to be happy, okay? And to be happy, um, I, I realize that I'm not going to be here on this earth forever. I know that I have an expiration date. I don't know when that is, but I'm not going to sit around and wait for opportunities to come to me. I'm going to go out there and create opportunities and I'm not gonna just sit in my office and wait for the phone to ring. I'm going to pick up the phone and call people. Like one of my strategies is to go to conferences. Like I am a conference junkie. Yeah, you You'll are. see me, I go to conferences all the time. And I meet people at these conferences. In fact, the client that we're going to work with out in New Zealand, I met at a conference two years ago at an after party in a bar. Now at that time, <laughs> this is funny, this is a true story. My wife was mad at me because she's like, why don't you come home? You're, you're, you're staying late just so you can drink. Right. Okay, I'm like, you don't understand, I'm networking. Like, she didn't get it. A little buzz. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you saw that post in the in the Facebook group when someone was like, I'm trying to go to conferences and I'm, what's yeah, the yeah. best way to do it? Yeah, and I'm like, dude, I think, um, I was like, this may sound weird, but go to the after party, go to the bar. You could probably use some liquid courage. And clients are way more open to just talking to you about their problems and their issues after they've had a few drinks. It sounds funny, okay, but I don't know, for me it worked. But long story short, the, the, the client that we're going out to to work with now, I met at a bar in an after party at a conference and it was a two year conversation where we continued to communicate and talk and you know, just a collection of things that have turned into now what is this amazing opportunity um, to go and, and do some really cool stuff with a, with a company that is someone who I would say is in alignment with the type of customer that I want to work with. Because right now, like I could take on customers that don't serve me and, and my goals, but then I always ask myself, like, would I even want to put them in my portfolio? Like, if I don't want to put them in my portfolio and they're not willing to like do something really cool and radical, like what I want to do, then I just don't really want to work with them. So I'm 
I'm blessed in, in the respect that, like, yeah, we get to kind of pick and choose now. Whereas before, I would just take any. Sure. Just throw me some meat and I'll eat it. You know, like, now I'm like, I want the, I want the big fat filet. Now, you touched on a whole bunch of things, so I got a breadcrumb list, and that's yeah, why I had to cool. get my notebook out. So part of your whole thing is you're, you're not very patient because you realize you're going to die and time is limited. And you, you want to see what you can do today versus wait. And that reminded me a lot of two people. One was Gary Vaynerchuk. And I remember seeing a video of his on YouTube. Three, word, uh, three words. Give me inspiration for any day I'm throwing down. Three words. Three words. You're going to die. Yeah, that's inspiration. Do something about it. Uh, get to it and put your body into motion and do what it is you're supposed to be doing instead of wait. Mm -hmm. And that's like the raw Gary Vaynerchuk version of it. And the other person who said it much more eloquently is a uh, man I respect a lot, Steve Jobs, uh, during his Stanford commencement speech. And he said that you should live your life as if one day you will die because one day you'll be right. And he says death is the mother of invention because things die, it makes way for other things to happen. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. In your story, it took you two years to close a client. You're actually really patient, believe it or not. You've got the balance of both virtues in the right space because the people have this inverted. So when you're working with a prospective client, don't look for the short-term sale, like I wanna make a logo for you, or this guy doesn't wanna hire me right now, blow him off. You're actually engaging with this person for the long term and actually bore fruit. The reason why you're going to New Zealand is because you hung out at a bar, you continued the conversation with him, and you continued to create materials that were valuable to him. You turn him into a fan, so when the time was right for him, not for you, and that's a difference. You're waiting for the time to be right for him. You didn't force the sale, yeah. which is really, so, so there's a little respect, irony I, I there. So patient. you're very patient. You know, you're, you're right. I'm very attuned, I think, to what my, like I definitely don't want to be over pushy. Um, and I want to continue to provide value. Um, but here's the thing. If I didn't get him, it's not going to affect my life because I'm you weren't waiting around doing for him. other right. things. You know what I mean? So like, just because I have this guy on the hook, that's a great opportunity, doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Or you're planting seeds. Right. And, and you're not sitting there planting one seed and waiting for that to mature and to, to reap the, the yeah, fruit or the I'm vegetable, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're planting seeds all the time. I remember talking to you and kind of like, you're like, I got a process, but I'm curious about what it is that you're doing, mm -hmm. how you're able to do it. And I remember this very vividly. Um, I think I called you from the car somewhere. It was one of those weird conversations over the phone. You asked me some questions. I think you were at a cafe or something because it was very loud in the background. I think 10, 15 minutes into the conversation, you're like, dude, stop, stop. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't. You're like, no, no, no. I can't take any more information. I'm ready to apply this right now. Thank you so much. I wrote as much as I can and I've absorbed as much as my brain can handle. I'm, I'm done. Let's talk about that transformation for you just a little bit. What happened there? I did have a process and it was called the, the brand audit, which right. actually sounds super daunting. Like the customers are like, oh, a brand audit. <laughs> what do you I sell it for, by the way? Um, so the audit was, um, man, it was anywhere from like $2,500 to $5,000, but I always wanted to do it in person. So everything I do is always like in person. The problem with my old way of doing it was like, it was kind of like a workbook. And it was literally like question, oh. answer. How do you guys I would do like the sit with them and like watch them fill it out. <laughs> <laughs> is what I would do. <laughs> now looking back in hindsight, it was horrible. People were so like, how many pages was this workbook? Oh my God, as many pages as you could imagine. Again, I thought, I thought the more pages, the more value, right? <laughs> What was that energy in the room like? Dude, it was horrible. That's when I <laughs> called you. So I was in Spokane doing this for one of our clients and I was like, man, I just had this feeling that they're totally not interested because like they're looking at their phones and like they're not engaged. That's when you realize, okay, maybe there's a different way. There was a part of me that understood that um, you have to be very consumer centric, user centric, um, if you really want to do big business, right? And you really want to change, like make an impact for the customers. So I knew that, but I didn't have the framework. What you and I are doing today, we work more as facilitators to help to surface uh, pain points, um, insights and challenges 
for the company, for the business goals, for the user, and all those kinds of things. And what we're able to do is use our personality, use our vocabulary, use our ability to empathize and to read people and to help to connect things. So you've been doing this process for quite some time and you just started to, you had an epiphany during one of these sessions where my clients are disengaged, something was going on. How did things change for you? Now we can get into the transition part, you know? Like we know what the before looks like, like talk about the bridge to the after. What was the trigger? I mean, I guess the trigger, a, a lot of the trigger was the process. So there was actually a, a, an outcome. There was something that came from the work that we were doing. The audit was a book that like they would give back to me. I'd be like, cool, thank you. That was it. Cool, thanks. Like now I have this, maybe I'll, I'll take some of the words that you put together and put it on your website. So oh, now, like, not very actionable then. Oh, there's nothing actionable. It was a show. I was putting on a show. <laughs> it wasn't a great show, but you put on a show. Dude, on. I put on a show. I did it All for right. a couple of years. It worked. Okay. Okay. I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing, and even with core, I wasn't sure what I was doing when I started doing it. I just started doing it. But then what happened was I actually had really substantial information and data that I then could apply. You know, not based out of theory, but out of like real tactical information. So now I have tactical information that I can apply to truly help my customers' businesses. Let me understand the change in process and, and relationship and that a little bit, okay? The one thing that you said to me was I was doing it all wrong. I needed to talk to and work with the client and not make him fill out sheets. Right. So it's almost like you burned all the sheets and then he's like, there's no more sheets, I'm gonna work with you. I'm gonna direct this conversation and it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be fluid and you're gonna walk away with something much clearer. But right. to somebody who doesn't know, like looking behind the curtain and knowing what it is we're talking about, how would you describe that in real terms? I mean, the best way to describe it is discovery. Okay. So I went from audit to discovery. Like I am discovering things. I am revealing things. I am uh, finding things that otherwise I wouldn't because I'm not asking the right questions. And they were like, what is your vision? What are your five fundamental values? Those are great questions to ask. I mean, you can ask them. That's, that's awesome. Um, but when you start asking questions about like, their business and you start asking questions about how they internally run their business, their employees, their departments, um, the potential streams of revenue, what types of point of sale systems are they using? So we're like scratching these, these areas in their business and it's starting to reveal truths that they otherwise didn't know. Um, and then from that, we're able to prioritize what to do next. What's happened is, is truly um, unique and, and it's just, it's changed the way that I'm going to do business moving forward.